welcome everybody and uh, i am standing between your lunch and you know <laughs> i would take some time but i'm here to have a, some good conversation and share my experience of building a cyber security product from the beginning so uh, i have been uh, data scientist uh, now actually ai scientist whatever you call it from long time uh, let's not get into the history but what i want to know from you is how many of you are into the cyber security okay so i can actually pitch my talk accordingly and uh, so you know seven years ago i predicted you know one of the uh, conference talk that you know there would be conferences and there will be uh, networking events where people will be talking about just random forests, exibus, and that time, you know, people were saying, no, 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 we are not there yet. Now, I can predict that, you know, a few years from now, everybody will, will be talking about PowerShell. They will be talking about what are the attacks you are getting and why are you getting it, how to overcome it, because I can see it. Because there are a lot of loose ends where it is very easy to take over. So let's start with. So what we'll do is, we'll start with a big problem. What is the problem definition? What is the magnitude of that? Then we'll get into how we can address some of the problems using deep learning. And then, you know, let's make it like more conversational. I don't mind having a questions in between. I would be actually more than happy to do it. And then we will go through the real case studies and conclude with something like, okay, what is the takeaway message if I am not from cybersecurity, but you know, I want to apply in some other field. So I'll give you some takeaway message on that as well. So time to act. So what if I say that you know, the person whom you're next to you, you shared your hand, right? And you introduced yourself just by telling your name and, and if I just you know, gather a bunch of data from your Facebook, LinkedIn, I can actually predict uh, I have a GAN network and that GAN network can predict what kind of last five passwords you may be setting up. It is actually possible. We haven't released that model. We have that, the thought, we are experimenting it, but you know, we, had, we don't want to release that in the wild, but it is very much possible because the deep learning, machine learning has reached to that stage. There are only n number of things which we imagine, right? Which we have a, you know, okay, what would typically would you do, right? You will have some birth date, you will have some father's name, mother's name, you will have some, you know, kid's name or birth of city, you know, what are the things? You just take a n dimension, so, oh, come on, you, all of you are data scientists, right? You just permute from there and you know, have uh, some regex and you know feed that to the GAN and you know it's gonna learn it from millions of data points and figure out what that function is. But attackers don't need to do that. They may be doing it, but they don't need to do that. They do it very easy. They do they are they are way sharper and clever. What they do is very simple, social engineering. They will figure out, okay, here is Satnam. He likes to do rock climbing. I'm just gonna send him a, some rock climbing festival link and he's gonna click on it and that malware is gonna drop. Either it's gonna be uh, based on a macro, you know, if it is, you know, he, he also knows that, you know, I use more of a Mac. So he will use a different technique. He won't use a, a Microsoft Office based. He'll use a different one. He'll just send me a zip and that zip, the Mac Safari, when it unzips it, it's gonna execute that payload and he's gonna take over. The story is over. So when you say this particular graph, what it shows, it takes only few minutes. It's just a matter of few minutes for any adversary to come into any enterprise, you name it. And this is Verizon telling it in 2018. They are telling the same thing in 2019 as well. The plots are different. I kept this plot because uh, I, it was much more clear in telling the message. Now, if you take a look at the right side of the graph, it takes a few minutes for adversity to get in, but 
in order to detect that you have been compromised, it takes an hours and months, correct? So the problem is highly skewed, highly asymmetric, okay? And you talk about data breaches and attack, um, we name it every company, at some point they have been breached. And you take it any sector, you know, the mo one of the sector which is predominantly attacked is the financial sector. Adversaries goes where the money is. That makes sense, right? That's what they do. They also work, you know, in, a, in their own shifts, but they will be working in a different time zone. They also have holidays. So <laughs> they, they have very structured process to do all these attacks. So let's try to understand what the problem is. Now if you look at, uh, I'm talking about more enterprises here. So if you took, take a look at enterprise network, right? This is what the typical enterprise is. You have the various uh, departments, depending on you know, which enterprise you're talking about. Let's say you know, this is a typical enterprise network, engineering, operations, and uh, sales, HR, so you do some basic hygiene, you do the network segmentation, and so that you, know, you don't want the threats to move around, you don't want malware to move around. So you do all that. But then you have a question of you know, multi-dimensional security, right? You have network security, endpoint security, and so on, right? The, now the latest one is the cloud security. Right now, if somebody has experience in cloud and then you know they have cloud security experience as well, they're sitting in Santa Clara, you just make a deck and go to the VC, I'm pretty sure you'll be able to raise your seed funding right there. That's how the market is right now. Now when I talked about the seed funding and the VC and the m &A, this is a picture here. I'm sorry about like you know the crowded space here, but my intention over here is the cybersecurity is a complex problem. So if you, uh, it's not readable, but I'm gonna read it for you. So on the top left, what you see is a network and infrastructure security. Then you see web security, endpoint security. In the endpoint security itself, there are like some 50 vendors. Then you go for MSSP, risk and L compliance, identity and access management, security operations center. I can keep on reading. But I would actually encourage you to look out for Momentum Cyber uh, Report. And uh, what my goal over here is that in each of these silos, they need data scientists. In each of them. Now when we talk about a network endpoint, network security, it started in 80s, intrusion detection system and so on. But now there is a next version of that. The data is being pumped to the cloud and then in the cloud you're doing the anomaly detection. So the reincarnation of the problem is going more on a magnitude and at a more higher scale, but the problems are there and each one of them need the AI and machine learning. Now you talk, uh, talk about the cybersecurity problem space last year, $6.2 billion were invested. And if you talk about the number of companies, m &A transactions happened like 183. And there are 3,500 cybersecurity companies. We are just one of them. But cybersecurity problem is so rich and so deep that you have to break it up in pieces and then you have to address this. And that is actually also one of the problem that these are all different silos and somebody has to come and orchestrate that. That's where I see that machine learning and AI has to play that symphony role. Now, I'm assuming that you know, if you go and talk to CISOs, they will go and say that, okay, yes, I don't need another vendor. I don't need another technology. I'm gonna make sure of the basic hygiene. So these are the basic hygiene. I'm assuming that you're gonna take care of that. So you take care of the basic hygiene. Obviously you need to keep on patching. Your vulnerabilities, you have to keep patching, keep up to it, 
keep updating it. But think about it, you have a 40,000 endpoints, Microsoft just released a one critical bug and you have to update all 40,000 of them. It will take time, right? And then during that time, it is actually vulnerable and that's where the WannaCry and the ransomware use that advantage and they spread. So let's talk on to what we talked about, the magnitude of the problem and how, what part of that AI and ML can address it. How also we will discuss that. So when we discuss machine learning and deep learning, before that let's talk about data, right? 80% of the things what we do is data manipulation, preparation and so on. What are the different data points we are talking about, data sources we are talking about? Now here are the few data sources we are listing from network point of view, endpoint point of view, from authentication point of view. I mean these are few buckets. There are five more buckets. You know I can present a, probably a workshop only on what are the data sources. And depending on what data source you are targeting, the volume and the size may be different. See for an example, network log. Net flow is a huge. You are watching each and every endpoint and you are watching the interactions among them, watching the, uh, how much traffic is going from each router and switch in, in the enterprise. It's a lot of data, right? And now if you talk about endpoint logs, endpoint logs, we, we have the endpoints, let's depending on the Mac and which OS it is, but you will have the generic things, what processes are running, what applications are running, what files got changed, created, and so on, right? If you take a look at those, like, that becomes like a thousand dimension categorical data. So the problem, uh, another challenge over there is unstructured logs. So you have to convert that into the structured data and then you process it. Now, is this something brand new are we talking about? Not really. I mean, this has been addressed from 90s. It's just like there is a game between adversary and a defender. Obviously, adversaries are, you know, way ahead in the game. They're always ahead because in order to uh, hack a code and take over, you just may need to write 10 lines of code. But in order to make sure that what are the different surfaces from where I, I need to secure it, you may need to write 10,000 lines of code. And not, it's not about the coding, it's also about the, the different angles from the human angles, right? So those are also equally vulnerable. So it has been addressed. So if you see the revolution and evolution, both of it in the security space, we move from rule based to data mining to machine learning now we are moving more towards the deep learning. But what has been the driving part so far till 2015, 2016, where the UBA, user analytics entity, user entity and um, analytics behavior, which basically talks about that I'm gonna model each entity in the network, enterprise, I'm going to model its behavior and whenever the behavior changes, I'm going to flag the anomaly. But that modeling, that behavior is not straightforward, right? We, there are different time zones, different places, different uh, angles, you know, different attributes due to which the behavior changes, right? So, and then also depending on if you're talking about the entities, right, the different kind of servers. So, it's, it's not a straightforward. The another thing is, okay, even if you generate the anomalies, somebody has to validate them. Do we have enough security analysts? Unfortunately not. In a typical security operation center, you get 500 to 600 alerts in a typical. Now, how many analysts they typically have? Like four or five. And each analyst, how much he can investigate? Maybe at most, 10. 
so all you are able to address is like you know 50 of them and at so i am saying this is a highly like ambitious and highly optimistic scenario you may be invest able to investigate 10% of the alerts so the 90% of it is still remains so machine learning and ai if it is generating more anomalies it's not going to help the security So the data mining earlier was more about like you looking at the clustering and then saying that okay, then you tag it, okay, it was it is a malicious traffic or a benign traffic. So there were much more engagement with the analyst over there. But when you move to the machine learning way, you got a lot more tagging done. And you got the tagging done, so now you are able to say the machine learning classifier is able to say it is a malicious or a benign traffic. But at the same time, even if it is able to tag it, somebody has to validate if you want to switch, if you want to stop that particular switch or you want to take out that or you want to take over, take out uh, that particular endpoint, you have to validate that. And that is the response part of it which, which is still manual. So it is like a human being, right? I have got a brain, I am looking at the thing and identifying the thing. But what I, uh, what I uh, probably felt some, some months back is that this cyber security space, apart from the machine learning, there is another aspect, this knowledge graph. Because what I believe there are 12 I will bring that, yeah, I will bring that the knowledge, you are, you are up to the point that how do we bring in the domain knowledge and the knowledge and weave it along with the machine learning. Yes, there are actually two aspects to it. One is bringing up the domain knowledge and other is as this particular cyber domain is almost like 16 different like variations like the web security and then comes the physical, physical security. So suppose I'm a hacker, I'm probably sending you, you a web packet which actually you open up and it then hits the physical layer. So when we are having two different machine learning models so probably that is probably uh, detecting that is a web security. It detects no, it's a fine. It's a good packet, okay. And this model, this tells that fine. It it was just a normal TXT file. It is also fine. But when you actually join these two things, what I'm telling you is basically to join all yeah, these. How do we bring the context together? Yes, like like. So yeah. sure, I'll get to that part as well. Thank you. So I think uh, your what your point is that how do we bring the context together? Yes. Uh, I'll take the next question. Just I want to move forward and show you some concrete example because we talk more at a higher level. And I want to get to at least one or two examples and show you the real thing. So here are some examples. I mean, this this is an example from Cisco, and this is a very powerful example. It is in the production. You can look it up. Uh, I have the references here. How do you figure out a malicious traffic in malicious encrypted traffic? So I encourage to have a look at that. Malware detection. This is a work by Sophos. And I give them a huge credit in terms of publishing their work. They have at least four or five papers on RZIP. You can look it up. And uh, you know, one of them uh, I have listed over here. What they are doing is they are leveraging deep learning for doing a malware detection because their product is endpoint based. And you can look at the multi attribute. Uh, and you don't need to actually define the features and that's where you were saying that okay can I use a domain knowledge to define the features and then do my classification or let's you know use a deep learning to go ahead and you know without the definition of features. So this is again a huge topic. I will give you one example and then you know, for specifically for malware detection, uh, I encourage you to take a look at their papers. For another one is adversarial machine learning and you know, when I said to start with prediction of the password, this is just a one example. Now attacks on self driving cars, how do you confuse an images? 
I mean this area of adversarial machine learning is also huge. So, I encourage you to look at the ML exploit. Now, what are the different use cases? So, we talked about the era of anomaly detection. Now, the second era of AI and machine learning in security is using a deep learning. Obviously, you need to have labels. That is where it will be successful. So, here are the use cases which I found it very solid and crisp. In fact, for a bunch of them, you can also find Kaggle uh, competitions and you can get the data sets from there and try it out yourself. So, let me walk through with a one case study. I am going to show you the code and give you a, a sort of a glimpse of you know how we are applying machine learning here for one of the problem here. So, now what we started with, we started with the breadth, we are shrinking it, we are taking a few specific examples and sort of like get, make a hypothesis how we are going to tackle the problem piece by piece, number one and number two is how I weave in the things together and number three is you know how do I bring the domain knowledge as well. So, the tow traffic. Um, tow traffic is being used a lot by adversaries and most of the traffic in a tow is malicious and Cloudflare is very successful in detecting the tow traffic. Um, I am not advocating any specific company, but the you know that is what I found in the research. So, uh, here is a data set which we got uh, tow and a non tow data set and obviously, as you said earlier that getting a data set itself is a big challenge. Uh, in this case, we uh, reached out to them and we got the data set. The data set was obtained by students over several weeks. They did the activities over the Tor network and over a non-Tor network and they did whatever activities they were doing in the non-Tor case like in a regular traffic. The same activities like the email, chat, browsing, they all did in the tow traffic as well. So, objective over here is how do we classify it. So, let us let us take a look at that in the Python notebook. So, we have all the libraries ok and what we are doing over here is let us take a look at the data here right. So, the benign net uh, URLs. So, the problem definition over here is you are trying to figure out uh, sorry just a minute I this one is here my apologies just a minute. So, here <coughs> what we are saying is we have certain attributes of a tour traffic and certain attributes for non tour. So, in this particular case, we have the data available and uh, let us look at some of the attributes what we have what uh, this uh, Canadian institute uh, students they have collected. So, source port, destination port, the IP addresses, the flow duration, the flow statistics right, the standard deviation mean and so on and also the max max flow and so on. So, these are the different attributes which you present right, which is there in the data. This is a typical data analysis what you are doing. Now, you can say that ok Satnam you know is this the first step you always do, I always do as a first step even if I need to fit a deep learning neural network, I tend to have a some understanding of the data because that actually helps you to bring the domain knowledge. So, in this case if I you know the domain knowledge tells me that if I need to make a model source port destination port the IP addresses will be changing. So, I should not bring that into the model because you know I do not want to actually learn from those IP addresses there is nothing from then to learn I mean depending on which network you go slash 16 slash 24 you know which subnet you go you know it will be changing and it will be from enterprise to enterprise. So, you do not want to really bring that. So, you drop those column. Um, then you bring you know you keep the other columns and then obviously, you 
you look at the data, you look at the mean standard deviation, you realize that okay, let's I should do a pre-process and I should do some kind of a, a scaling between 0 and 1. So you take care of that. So I mean this is like the basic hygiene stuff, you keep on doing that analysis and then you look at okay, what are my dimensions and what's my ratio of a training data, test data. So uh, do I have enough data for my uh, malicious traffic? If not, okay, let's use uh, some uh, sampling technique which sort of like compensates for that. So we use a stratified sampling here and obviously the first one, uh, I actually took a smaller part of the data so that I can you know, run it faster and we build a logistic regression and that gives you me 90 percent accuracy and here my objective is not really uh, you know to get my best right away and I'll tell you what my objective is. So and then I say that okay, I'm going to fit a deep learning neural network, I'll make a feed forward neural network and fit it. So you, this is a standard Keras uh, and the feed forward neural network, the different layers you fit in and then you say that okay, I have several hidden layers and then I'm going to be fitting a neural network and then say that okay, what is my accuracy for that network? It turns out that okay, I am getting a somewhere around 96 or so. So the part which I want to stress here, this is a beginning, okay. Now if I have this kind of a problem statement, what we did, we took an academic part of it. We took the data which was in this case we got it from academia, but in the case of industry, how this happens, typically you may not have data. So you may need to generate a data if you are a startup. If you are an enterprise, you may have a data. And in this enterprise also, you may need to maybe, you know, you may not get all the data in a bunch of, so you may get a some part of it. So the question really comes that, okay, do I take a small bucket of the data and then, you know, analyze it? This is what it shows here. But when we need to make a production data and do a production model, obviously you need to get the whole, uh, the big data which we used to talk. Sure, question. I can't hear you. Is that a general property of networks in general or? Uh? So the sure. result uh, that you've shown, uh, there is higher support for non-TOR. So is that a general property of networks or the, I mean, no, what was the is, sampling? This is more specific to this data here. Okay, you know. but uh, how, how, how did you get the sample like? I want to okay. sort of. Okay, so um, I'll take this question because I want to move and give the big picture and then I will walk through with this particular data set, you know, just after my talk, I'll walk through with that. The reason for that is I have two more demos and I want to give a big picture of a cyber security. So now what we talked about here that we took a, uh, we took a one problem and we, we showed that how I apply the feed forward neural network. Now let me take the second problem and which this is actually the problem which you see quite a bit. When you click on it, it may go to a URL and can I predict it whether it's a I, is it a malicious URL or it's a benign URL? If you take a look at that, this problem has been addressed quite a bit. You know, it has been addressed depending on, again, the data size, but at the same time, adversaries are also evolving. So why, I'll give you an example here. See, if you take a look at the domains here, some of these domains are like the domain generation algorithm is generating it. If that is generating, it's a random thing. But adversaries come to know that okay, yes, the defenders have the algorithms which can detect these kind of a domains. So what they did, instead of using the random generation, they used the words from a dictionary and then uh, generate, started generating the domain. So those words are very nicely named. See for an example, home job institute. Now it, it's very nice, right? Now you give it to uh, earlier when you try to train your classifier with the random DGA based 
data, right, versus a non-DGAVIS, it will learn the patterns. But now the, sex, sex, the challenge comes that, okay, if you have this kind of a data, would you be able to detect it? The another challenge comes that they actually route the data through the Twitter or through the Facebook. Now Twitter and Facebook, everybody uses. How do you flag that as a malicious? So, this is a one typical pipeline, okay. I am not saying this is the best model in my demos. I am just saying this is one of the approach and telling you that how do we address it? How do we build it up as a problem and as a machine learning problem, as a deep learning problem? So, you have a benign and a malicious data. In this particular case, you got the data from the various sources over the internet. If you are building it for academic purpose, you may get some data. But for a production version, you may need to buy a lot of data. And you may actually need to buy it. So the objective over here is, can I detect the benign versus the malicious URL, okay? So I have benign URLs and I have malicious URLs, okay? And can I make a classification, class, classifier which can uh, classify it? Sure, you can. You can start with very simple, you can start with logistic regression, XGBoost, and then you can slowly build it up. In this particular case, we applied LSTM network because we are actually looking at each of that uh, character as a word in terms of uh, the LSTM and then we are saying, okay, I'm going to learn that word embedding and I'm not going to specify what feature I'm looking for and that would give me higher accuracy. So we do all the basic uh, hygiene stuff, you know, what's my training test data and I'm just going to rush it through just, but I can take the questions uh, on this particular notebook after the talk and then you know we build the model we have we have an embedding layer lstm layer we do a dropout and make another dense layer and you know you predict whether it's a benign or malicious and you it gets you somewhere around 95% or so but in the production is this a good number it's not it has to be 99.9999, something like that. The reason for that is the percentage Y, how many of those URLs you have to still, you know, take it, blast it in a sandbox and then validate, oh, is this really a malicious or not? Because it is coming in the, these URLs are typically embedded in the user's email. We, we want the genuine and the benign emails to come to our, inbox, right? So all these calculations are happening in a fraction of milliseconds. So there are very tight timelines on which these calculations have to happen and there is a very tight bound on what is the allowed accuracy. So these are the considerations which have to be taken into account when you make a production deep learning neural network. Sure. So in a security as such, you, what we do is, you know, we, we want the highest precision. You, you actually, you are okay with having a false positive because you want to secure it. So you, you want to have a more, you are, you are actually liberal towards having a more false positive, but you don't want to miss detection. So that is the, that is like almost like across the board. You pick up any problem, that's what the security you look at. Uh, just, just, just two more minutes, and then I will open it for the things. Uh, so, what we talked about the the various use cases, right? Now, what I'm going to say is something different. 
what I am saying is now we talked about okay how I am going to model it machine learning AI you still have anomalies you still have alerts somebody has to investigate. The question comes that can we do something different. So, if this is a chess game between adversary and the defender can we slow him down for each move if he has to think whether it is a real or a fake then if we can achieve that it is like a race right in that race if we can slow him down then we will get as a defender we will get lot more time for action. So, so this framework is called a deception. So, out of these doors if the attacker comes in he does not know which one is real or which one is fake. So, what I am trying to say is let us think about it on a LinkedIn you have bunch of email addresses bunch of employees and few of them are fake adversary does not know does not know it. Adversary when he comes to the network when he does a nmap scan a few of those computers are actually fake. They have the services they I mean they they are actually being projected by some server somewhere they have the real services it it when the adversary does a scan it will look like a very genuine computer the name also like that. The name will also look like this see for an example here you have mum EPS 4343. Now, if I have another computer which is also mum EPS 4353 and this 53 is you know happen to be the real one, but you know I have a 6 3 now that is actually the decoy. So, these decoys will actually make the adversary to think whether this one is a real or it is like a setting up the traps right. If I set up the traps then can I do something better. So, what we could do is we set up these traps and I am not advocating any particular product what I am saying is the approach is much more broader. You take your AI and machine learning which was like you know figuring out ok this this classification that classification, but you still do not know where the adversary is. In the house it is like if I have a some fake jewelry and if somebody is trying to steal it right then ok yes you actually get a signal that you know you have a thief in the house. It is like a motion detector right. In the enterprise we do not have a motion detector. So, de deception is going to act like a motion detector and now I will combine with AI. So, here in this particular example what we are saying is there are lot of host there are lot of endpoints. So, in this room we have a lot of Mac and I would keep some more Mac which are fake and which will be you know given sort of like I am not getting into how we do it, but you know, let us say there are there. Now, when the adversary is gum bump onto one of them and you interact with him then you can get lot more data lot more information about him and then you do the AI. So, uh, I have a this particular example I am just going to show you and you know this particular technology part I will tell you how it has been done, but let me show you this. Uh, attack. So, the attack uh, what we are doing over here is ok. So, here is an attack here. So, the attack uh, what adversary is uh, trying to do over here is that he he you know the typically what you do here you have a phishing attack. You take over a one computer and then you escalate the privileges right. So, in this case you uh, the adversary is taking one of the script have you anybody heard of PowerShell and all that yeah. So, what adversary is doing is he has taken a PowerShell uh, script and he is modifying it but before you know he modifies it he also checks it on a virus total that how many of AVs are actually detecting it. So, he goes there 
So, and he checks it in this case, you know, that 20 of them have detected. And then, you know, he goes and he changes certain words, like, you know, he changes uh, some variable names and some function names, only this much, no code change as such, it's just a variable and function name changes. He is easily able to get those out of 22, he is able, able to get them to 5. So now there are only uh, 3 of them actually, so he is now able to get to them. So now only 3 of them are able to detect it. So just the function name uh, and the variable name change, uh, see that is the reality. Now, if he obfuscate, then only two of them are able to uh, detect it. So, what I am trying to say is, it is as simple as that, you from the internet, you take any script, you change the function name, you change the variable name, out of 60 antivirus, only two can detect it, okay. You do not need a rocket science. This is, this is what adversary needs to do. So, the question comes that, can we do some detection with the deception in AI together? Sure, you can. If you have this deception there, then adversary does not know that he is engaging with the real or with a fake. So, everything whatever he does is getting recorded, okay. All the activities are getting recorded. So, in this particular case, all the PowerShell logs are getting recorded and we have a machine learning classifier which is able to detect whether this is a benign script or a malicious script or is it, you know, what kind of uh, tool has been used or uh, it is able to figure out that, okay, what is the intent of the adversary. So, in this case, you know, adversary is uh, escalating the privileges, he is just executing it. So, what we are able to show here in the defending place here, let me show you that here. That we are able to detect it, you know, this one, I am sorry if it is not visible, but what it is telling that, that there is a privilege escalation attack which uh, adversary did and we are able to detect that. And this is all done behind the scene, it is all AIML. So, let me show you AIML and the data science, uh, sorry, the deception together. So, how it works? You have the logs, PowerShell logs, you do a pre processing, and then you have a set of classifiers. A one set of classifier will tell you what is the tactic. And the another set of classifier can predict whether it is an obfuscated, not obfuscated, and another classifier can predict whether which tool it is. See, all this you can model it as a machine learning problem. So, what we talked about, we started a very breadth. We went into depth into very specific examples, right. And then we said like, there are two, three things which we need to take into account. One, you, which you rightly pointed out, can we weave in the things together? So, for that, uh, I do not have in the presentation what the recent approaches are. You model it as a graph database. You take a look at all the incidents together and you take a look at the source destination. You weave in together. You, you say, okay, this incident happened after this on this particular source only. And then somebody has to have weave in the domain knowledge. Yes, this could be because of this payload. So, you typically model it as a graph and then you take a look at whether you have some behavior before and then you say whether it is an anomaly or not. The another problem, another way to approach this one is also a, something like uh, when you are making your classifiers, you can bring the domain knowledge over there in terms of a features. So, I think I said enough, let me take your questions, there were bunch of questions here. Yes. Correct. Sure, sure. 
Correct. That is an excellent question. So, let us take an example of a ransomware. See from an example of WannaCry. Before WannaCry came, all these uh, machine learning and the deep learning based vendors were not able to detect it. But as soon as they got the few samples, they were able to quickly run their models and then update that model and deploy it because they were mostly in the cloud based. But what you can do is see these machine learning and deep learning based models are still better than the rule based because those were really looking for a signature. Now what this promise is that if somebody does a very tweak on that uh, until unless they explore a new zero day vulnerability then machine learning and deep learning classifier will fail because that is a completely different. But if probabilistically if it is nearby then it is able to do it. So, in a sense when the new malware comes which is of the similar family the model will be able to detect it. But if it is coming from entirely different family altogether which is a different zero day vulnerability you, you still need to wait for the samples to come or still need to wait for the models to get updated. So, typically they get updated quite frequently by the vendors and the advantage over there is that like you really do not need to have any earlier it used to be more look for a signature you blast uh, the model into a sandbox you look for the signature you look for which hash to look for and then you code that signature into the antivirus that is like a very slow process. But now these deep learning based models you are able to update it but still they are you know they cannot do it for completely unknown thing that is true for any domain. Any unknown data set if you take a look at which for which the it has not been trained the classifier will not be able to predict it. Some more questions. Sure. Okay. Okay. No, it is not fine. See, when the Wana cry got exploded and you know it was spreading, the news got spreaded like the news went very fast. But still, people were getting uh, you know, you if you take a look at the Wana cry spread, people were getting the attacks like the, it is just like in a city, like okay, you got in a part of the white field, it got a blackout and it is getting blackout, blackout, blackout until ISC. No, but you know that that part of the uh, town got a blackout right. If I up able to update my model well in time I am still able to you know my 70 percent of my city I am still able to stop uh, doing a blackout. So, what what I am trying to say is that there is a time to react and the deep learning model here or AI based models are giving you that ability. But the next thing what I said was if you combine it with a deception then you can get much more faster before even the wanna cry spread it then you can actually say it because the wanna cry is using a some specific vulnerability and in the enterprise network if I deploy that vulnerability in a some computers and if some malware is trying to exploit it then I can detect it that oh here is able to you know somebody is trying to uh, some malware is trying to spread. So, you can detect it faster. So, there is a there is a race between detecting it faster and then you know and then there is another race between some zero day thing right. For zero day you you still you know those are in the in the security domain they are called APTs advanced persistent threats and they are typically you know done by the nationwide nation act actors you know some particular country may be behind it and they have very very specific targets. So, over there what defenders what companies they do is they try to stop the lateral movement. So,
So, if something has been compromised, you know, you can't stop. As I sh showed you in my first screen, it takes only few minutes to get compromised. What people do is they assume that it will get compromised no matter what you do. What they try to do is how do I contain it? How do I make sure that it does not spread it? So, over there, there are a bunch of techniques, and one of them I talked towards the end was combination of a deception and AI together. 